closer. Have a look. Have a look. It's like St. Peter's. Tourists describing the Rotunda Fresco as quoted in the official capital guidebook. We, the people. It's like St. Peter's. The Dome of the Great Sky. Chapter 23 of Rulers of Evil. Archbishop John Hughes of New York sailed for Rome in the autumn of 1851, just after Congress had approved funds to enlarge the capital. Hughes had laid the cornerstone for St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan, and had helped the Jesuits establish Fordham University in Westchester. Now he was helping them decorate the capital's interior. In Rome, Superior General John Rotan, where I have to make a little... Um, comment on. In a few pages from here I will go into Superior General Peter Jan Becks. As you remember I said both Peter Jan Becks and the mentioned General Jan Rotan seemed to me to be Dutch or Belgian when I read chapter 22 just because of their name. I just got a hint there. So they are Dutch Belgian. <laughs> the one is Dutch the other one Belgian. And I will explain the successor of Rotan a little later in the reading. But here's an interesting thought. As you probably remember from chapter 22, you know that these two generals worked for the flooding of the United States of America with, first and for all, Catholics from Ireland and from Italy and I don't know whatever Catholic countries. Today we have at least two generals working for the same goal in addition to flood Europe with Islamic refugees. And, of course, America, as I mentioned, working for the same goal, flooding America with more Catholics. One of them being Peter Hans Kolvenbach, who is also Dutch from origin. Well, every official paper will tell you that Peter Hans Kolvenbach resigned in 2008 and Adolfo Nicolas took over, who has already announced that in 2016, this year, he will retreat. Therefore you have to know that never ever before in the history of the Jesuits, a general, a superior general, has ever resigned living from his post. Hans Peter Kolvenbach, Peter Hans Kolvenbach was the first one, and I don't believe a little bit that he went away from the position of superior general, especially not after you know how very, very well Lorenzo Ricci was playing the game of deceit. Peter Hans Kolvenbach, Adolfo Nicolas, and not to forget our beloved Pope, Jorge Borgoglio, who also is a Jesuit of the Fourth Bar. They are as cunning as Lorenzo Ricci is, I'm quite sure. But the author continues on the second paragraph of the new open chapter 23. In Rome, Superior General John Rotan introduced the Archbishop to Constantino Brumidi, an artist boasting an impressive list of credits. Brumidi had painted and acclaimed, uh, an acclaimed portrait of Pio Nono, as you know, Pope Pius IX, which the Vatican still exhibits an immaculate conception in the little sanctuary of the Madonna of del Archetto in Via San Marcello, and the restoration of three 16th century frescoes in the Vatican Palace. Brumidi was good. General Rotan had determined to make him America's Michelangelo. Archbishop Hughes let it be known that Brumidi would be welcome to paint some frescoes in churches of the New York bishopry. General Rotan then went about making the Vatican's artist acceptable to American egalitarianism. Soon after the Archbishop left Rome for New York, the Vatican accused Constantino Brumidi of criminal acts. Supposedly, Brumidi had committed crimes during his membership in the Republican Civil Guard under Giuseppe Mazzini, the Italian Freemason who had recently led ill-fated nationalist revolutions against the papacy. These crimes were said to have included a. refusing to fire on his republican friends, b. looting several convents, and c. 
participating in a plot to destroy the Catholic Church, acts reasonably sure to merit a hero's welcome in Protestant America. The architect of the Capitol's unpublished dossier on Brumidi, which I was permitted to examine during 1993, notes that, quote, several widely divergent accounts suggest that Constantino Brumidi himself was probably the source of the last of at least some of the legends, unquote. Vatican Justice found the artist guilty in December 1851 and sentenced him to 18 years in prison. Several weeks later, the sentence was reduced to six years. And within two months, on March, 20, uh, on March 20th, Pio Nono himself quietly granted Bromidi an unconditional pardon. General Rotan then placed his newly created Republican freedom fighter on a ship bound for America. Bromidi arrived in New York Harbor on September the 18th. On November 29th, he filed for state citizenship with the New York Court of Common Pleas. Although the invite had come to paint New York churches, there was no such work to be done there. Instead, the Archbishop sent him to Mexico City, by way of Washington, D.C. In Washington, Brumidi was received by his Masonic brother, Thomas Eustick Walter. For two years, Walter had been serving President Millard Fillmore as architect of the Capitol. When the cornerstone for Walter's capital expansion plan was laid on the 4th of July 1851, President Fillmore and Commissioner of Public Buildings Benjamin B. French, who also happened to be Grand Master of the Masonic Fraternity, led a colorful ceremony. Washington's popular national intelligence reported the occasion was, quote, welcomed by a display of national flags and the rising of bells and the ring, sorry, and the ringing of bells from the various churches and engine houses, unquote. Thomas Walter needed Constantino Brumidi, an edifice as important as the United States Capitol, like the palaces of Augustus and Nero, the baths of Titus and Livia, the loggia of Raphael at the Vatican, required the most noble and permanent interior decoration possible. Only fresco painting, in which pigments are mixed with wet mortar immediately before application to the surface, would suffice and only Constantino Brumidi, of all the artists living in America, knew how to paint fresco. But the dome was not yet ready to be frescoed, so the artist was rooted to the sunny, Italianate climate of Mexico City to enjoy life, to ponder his subject matter at a, usual, uh, at a, at a casual pace, to wait for the call. Two years later, on December 28, 1854, less than three weeks following Pio Nono's decree to the doctrine of the Immaculate, uh, of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, Constantine Brumidi appeared in the office of Montgomery C. Meigs, supervising engineer of the Capital Extension Project. The Capital's unpublished dossier on Brumidi relates that as the two men conversed in broken French, Brumidi struck Meigs as quote a lively old man with a very red nose, either from Mexican sons or French brandies." Unquote. The immediate upshot of their conversation was a commission to paint a fresco covering the elliptical arch that one end, at one end of Meek's office in the capital. It was the first fresco ever painted in the United States, as well as Brumidi's first in five years. The fresco celebrated the coming civil war in, return, in terms of Roman history. According to the Commission's report, it depicted, quote, a senator who points to Rome and appeals to Cincinnati to come to the help of his country. Now, Cincinnati, probably I haven't told you this before in the reading, but what is the society of Cincinnati that Tapa Saucy mentions here right now? Before he goes into any uh, any deeper into the explanation of the Society of Cincinnati, I will give you a little bit explanation of that. The society is named after Lucius Quincticus Cincinnaticus, Cincinnatus, sorry, Cincinnatus, who left his farm to accept a term as Roman consul and served as Magister Populi, with temporary powers similar to that of a modern era dictator. He assumed lawful dictatorial control of Rome 
to meet a more a war emergency. When the battle was won, he returned power to the Senate and went back ploughing his fields. The society's motto reflects that ethic of selfless service. Omnia reliquit servave rem publicam, meaning he relinquished everything to save the Republic. On June 19, 1783, the General Society of the Cincinnati adopted the Bald Eagle as its insigne. It is one of America's first post-revolution symbols and an important piece of American iconography. It is the second official American emblem to use the Bald Eagle, following the Great Seal of the United States. Well, we talked about the Great Seal in Chapter 22, as you'll remember. The insigne may have been derived from the same discourse that produced the seal. Well, that may have, I think you can scratch. The suggestion of the bold eagle as the Cincinnati insigne was made by Major Pierre L'Enfant, a French officer who joined the American army in 1777, served in the Corps of Engineers and became one of the first members of the society. He observed that the bold eagle, which is unique to this continent and is distinguished from those of other climates by its white hat and tail, it appears to me to deserve attention. In 1783, L'Enfant was commissioned to travel to France to have the first eagle badges made, based on his design. L'Enfant later planned and partially laid out the city of Washington, D.C., as we read in Chapter 22. The medallions at the center of Cincinnati, American eagle depict, on the obverse, Cincinnatus receiving his sword from Roman senators, and, on the reverse, Cincinnatus as his plough being crowned by the figure of a theme, a personification of fame. The society's colors, light blue and white, symbolize the fraternal bond between the United States and France. George Washington was elected the first President General of the Society of Cincinnati. He served from December 1783 until his death in 1799. The second President General was Alexander Hamilton. Upon Hamilton's death, due to his duel with Aaron Burr, the third President General of the Society was Charles Coatsworth Pickney. In 1808 he ran unsuccessfully for President of the United States against James Madison. Its members have included notable military and political leaders, including 23 signers of the United States Constitution. When news of the foundation of this society spread, Judge Adenus Burke published several pamphlets under the pseudonym Cassius, where he criticized the society as an attempt at re-establishing an hereditary nobility in the new republic. I'm going to repeat that sentence because it is quite important. When news of the foundation of the Society of Cincinnati spread, Judge Adenus Burke published several pamphlets under the pseudonym Cassius, where he criticized the Society as an attempt at re-establishing an hereditary nobility in the New Republic. The New Republic was not to be reigned from noblemen, right? So why are they establishing a society of so-called noblemen in the so-called New World? And the first president of this country is even the chairman of that society, the first chairman of that society, 16 years long. Strange, huh? So at least you know a little bit what um, Cincinnati stands for and what this... Um, what this society from Cincinnati stands for. So according to the Commission's report, it depicted a senator who points to Rome and appeals to Cincinnati to come to help of his country. Cincinnati, the 5th century BC Roman dictator, was called to defend Rome twice, first from foreign invaders, then from own uh, common people. Likewise, American heroes first defended their Rome against foreign British invaders, and were now about to be called to defend the same Rome against her own seceding states. So you see much similarity between the history of the United States of America and old Rome, right? Brumidi completed the Cincinnati in March 1855. Meeks invited various congressmen to behold it. 
They were impressed. Thomas U. Walter was much delighted. On March 20th, Jefferson Davis approved of the Cincinnatus and authorized Meeks to negotiate a cellarite contract with Brumidi. Constantino Brumidi's lifetime career spent decorating the capital began on a salary of $8 a day. His contract allowed him to accept other artistic projects, but not to leave Washington. In November 1855, he began a canvas painting of the Blessed Virgin for St. Ignatius Jesuit Church in Baltimore, but was not present for its December 4th installation on the occasion of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. In the summer of 1862, <coughs> excuse me, in the summer of 1862, even as Thomas Crawford's statue was being cast at the Mills Foundry, you know, Freedom for the top of the Capitol, you remember? Thomas Crawford's statue? Thomas U. Walter wrote to Brumidi asking him to paint something monumental in real fresco to cover the 4,664 square foot inner surface of the Capitol's dome. Three weeks later, Brumidi submitted sketches of something he entitled Apotheosis of Washington. The word apotheosis was then commonly understood by its definition in Webster's Dictionary, 1829. The definition from Webster's. Apotheosis. The act of placing a prince or other distinguished person among the heathen deities. This honor was often bestowed on illustrious men of Rome and followed by the erection of temples and the institution of sacrifices to the new deity. Unquote. The act of placing a prince or other distinguished person. Now, George Washington, by being the chairman of the Society of Cincinnati, was kind of a prince, was kind of a king. And when we go into the documentary that Walter Feit made some years ago about the sustainable beamable princess look that up on Total Onslaught series I think it is you will see that every American president up to today two or three exceptions I think all have blood that can be traced back to European noble houses and even kingly blood so that you will have a prince over there in the United States of America who to the outward people is an elected president but for the people in the higher echelons who know about this stuff they know that he's a king actually on the page of on the bottom of page 250 the author continues Walter responded aesthetically to the apotheosis writing the artist that quote no picture in the world will at all compare with this in magnitude unquote he praised the design for worship for, uh, for he praised the design before worshipful master and commissioner of buildings Benjamin French as quote probably the grandest and the most imposing that has ever been executed in the world unquote French enthusiastically agreed, adding that the Secretary of Interior was also greatly impressed. Final approval of apotheosis at a price of $40,000 came on March 11, 1863, just as the Immaculate Virgin was being placed on her temporary pedestal on the Capitol's East grounds. Quote, Frustrating delays in manpower, unquote, according to official histories, would hold the fresco in abeyance until December 1864. On April 9, 1865, Richmond fell and the Confederacy surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant. Less than a week later, on the evening of April the 14th at Fourth Theater, during an instant of hilarious laughter, one of the country's leading actors, John Wilkes Booth, cried out an oath summarizing the liberation theology of Cardinal Robert Bellarmine. Sic semper tyrannis! Always this, meaning death, to tyranny. And fired a shot into the head of President Abraham Lincoln. Sic semper tyrannis is also the motto of Virginia, then considered a state in rebellion. 
Might Booth's cry have been intended to give the assassination the look of an official act of the Confederacy, much in the way Lee Harvey Oswald's much-touted sympathy for Cuba initially gave the Kennedy assassination the look of communist revenge? An illusion of official Confederate responsibility for a beloved president's assassination justified the elaborately cruel revenge which the federal government inflicted upon the southern states in order to bring all the states under the jurisdiction of Washington, D.C. The inferiority of states to the federal Rome is expressed in the, flag, in the law of flag. Wherever state and national flags are flown together, the national is always higher. Well, it's the same with the government. The civil power is high, but the spiritual power is higher. And the spiritual always reigns the civil. And that is how Rome works. And that's how they cover it. Their civil power under uh, the spirituality. And here you have the same stuff. The inferiority of states to the federal Rome is expressed in the law of flag. Wherever state and national flags are flown together, the national is always higher. So the national is always higher than the state. What that completely means you will learn as I go along in this chapter 23. Booth had associated with seven people who were brought to trial less than a month following the assassination. It was not a civilian trial, but a special 11-man military tribunal appointed by President Andrew Johnson, called the Hunter Commission. Counsel for the defendants objected to the commission, arguing that the military had no jurisdiction over civilians, and therefore the proceeding was unconstitutional. The objection was overruled, and the trial moved forward. Within seven weeks, the commission, a two-thirds majority, not the unanimity required of a civilian jury, found four of the conspirators guilty. On July 7th, 1865, they were hanged. Quote, the great fatal mistake of the American government in the prosecution of the assassins of Abraham Lincoln, wrote Reverend Charles Jenicky, the excommunicated priest from Lincoln had successfully defended in his early law career. See note chapter two, uh, note two in chapter twenty-two when you will go back to that, was to cover up the religious element of that terrible drama, but this was carefully avoided throughout the trial. Unquote. The religious element, the fact that all seven of the conspirators were devoted Roman Catholics, was carefully avoided because of who controlled the trial. As commander-in-chief of the armed forces, it was Johnson himself who quite constitutionally reigned supreme over the Hunter Commission. But Johnson was also a Freemason, which meant that he followed the wise directives of the unknown superior. Papa Nero. Thus, the real power behind the Hunter Commission was Superior General Peter Jean Bex. And now I will go into a little explanation of this General of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. A little history of this black pope, as I already announced in chapter 22, because this general was responsible among his predecessor for the Catholic immigration of the United States of America. Peter was a Belgian. He was Flemish in Belgium because, because Belgium was founded in 1831 and he was, already, uh, he was born in 1795. So he was a Belgian, born in Sichern, which is 15 kilometers from where I live, in the Diocese of Mechelen. He was 20 years old when he entered the seminary at Mechelen, but eight months after his ordination, he decided to become a Jesuit. On October 29, 1819, at the age of 24, he entered the society at Hildesheim, that's Germany. He became the chaplain and confessor of the Duke Ferdinand von anhalt köthen and after the death of the Duke, he rendered the same service for the Duchess when she moved to Vienna. In 1850, he became rector of Louvain, that's the city where I live here in Flam Flanders, and professor of canon law. Then, two years later, he became the provincial of Austria. After Rothan's death, 
the other one that I've spoken before, after Rotan's death, the 22nd General Congregation was called to be in session from June 22nd to last until August 31st, 1853. On July 2nd, this congregation elected the 58-year-old Bex as general. European politics at that time were in a sorry state and governments shifted from monarchy to republic overnight. It was a time of political unrest where seemed to be a revolution going on somewhere at any given time. In Italy too, the reunification was taking place with no one really knowing what it meant or how it would be accomplished. At the establishment of the Italian Republic in 1873, the Jesuits were expelled from the Collegio Romano, losing title to the name as well as to the property. They moved into the German college on, uh, on Via del Seminario, changed its name to Universite Gregoriana del Collegio Romano, and remained in the location until the political situation had changed in 1930, when they moved into their new building near the Quirinale. That is thus after the Lateran Treaty that gave the Vatican back its civil power. The contract Mussolini signed with the Vatican paid 750 million liras repair payment and that started the healing wound that we read on Revelation chapter 13. In 1873, too, it was judged prudent to move the courier. On October 30th, 1873, the general and two fathers moved to the Villa San Girolamo in Fiesole, which then became the seat of the Jesuit Curia Generalis. The air was certainly better there than in Rome, both physically and politically. On May 11th, 1883, Father Bex, the coming Superior General, announced that he was convening the 23rd General Congregation for September 15th. The reason for his announcement was that, with the Holy Father's consent, he had selected Father Antonio Maria Anderlidi as his permanent vicar general with the right of succession. He wanted the approval of the general congregation for this decision. Bex was getting feeble and needed the help of a trusted lieutenant. The fathers of the congregation approved his plan of action after Leo XIII asked Bex to remain and give guidance. On September 24, 1883, Bex then imposed silence on the whole congregation in reference to his affair. On January 20, 1884, Bex gave up almost all his authority as general into the hands of Andalidi. He then retired to the German college in Rome, where he lingered on quite feeble and finally, finally died three years later, on March 4, 1887. And the lady then succeeded him as the 23rd General of the Society of Jesus. Bex had been general for 33 years and 8 months, from 1853 until 1887, when he died at age 88 years in Rome. During his generalate, literary progress had been made by the founding of the new famous Jesuit journal La Civilta Cattolica in Naples, then moving to Rome, Razon y Fe in Madrid, and the first issue of Etude came out in Paris. The body of Father Peter Bex was taken to the Campo Verano Cemetery of Rome, where it was entered into the newly constructed Jesuit mausoleum. So that's a little bit background information on Je Superior General Peter Jean Bex, who together with his predecessor, Rothan, made sure the new founded United States of America got an invasion of Catholic people so that by the time of 1850 Roman Catholicism would be the biggest denomination quote unquote denomination in the United States of America well it's 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 a church it's not a denomination it's a church it's a church of Satan the Roman Catholics so just giving you a little bit more background knowledge. So I'm going to repeat the last sentence. Thus, the real power behind the Hunter Commission was Superior General Peter Jean Bex, a relatively young Belgian who was a great favorite of Pio Nono, Pope Pius IX, the only head of state in the world to recognize the Southern Confederacy as a sovereign nation. 
obedient to the will of General Banks, President Johnson issued an executive order closing the courtroom to the working press. At the end of each day, officials would ration to selected, ration to selected reporters from the Associated Press News carefully evaluated to keep quote unquote the religious element out of the public consciousness. Shall I read that again for better understanding? At the end of each day, listen carefully, officials would ration to select reporters would ration to selected reporters, I'm sorry. At the end of each day, officials would ration to selected reporters from the Associated Press News carefully evaluated to keep the religious element out of the public consciousness. How about freedom of press? Isn't that censorship as its best, what I've just read? Doesn't that smell like propaganda? Not telling the people what, how that, that this assassination had a religious element to it? I think that nobody who ever studied anything superficially as the history is written in the United States of America these days had any idea that the killing of Abraham Lincoln that the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and the killing of him had anything to do with a religious element. And you will probably not find many newspapers from that time where that something is printed because, you know, the Associated Press carefully evaluated to keep the religious element out of the public consciousness. That's how they do it. They own all the papers. They owned them already in the time of 1850 and before, and they own them still. Go back a few chapters. I told you the Roman Catholic Church says that all media is hers. Whether it's television, it's movies, it's printing press, whatever medium you have to communicate, also the Internet, it's all hers, she claims. Look it up for yourself. And here you can see how we have been betrayed by being told one side of the story and actually something quite different happened. What you can understand when you read some history books or some fact books like Rulers of Evil or sometimes even books where Rulers of Evil also takes his knowledge from, like Charles Chenequi and his book 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Something I can really advise you to, to have a read on. I'm going to continue now. Charles Chinnicky tirelessly investigated the assassination. After the conspirators were executed, <coughs> were executed, he went incognito to Washington and found that, quote, not a single one of the government men would discuss it with me, except after I had given my word of honor that I would never mention their names. I saw with a profound distress that the influence of Rome was almost supreme in Washington. I could not find a single statesman who would dare to face that nefarious influence and fight it down. Wow! Can you believe this? Go back to chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil. Subliminal Rome. We are here in chapter 23 and Charles Chinnicky states that by the time of 1867, 1865, I could not find a single statesman who would dare to face that nefarious influence and fight it down, that influence of Rome over Washington. What do we have today? What do we have in chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil? Subliminal Rome? All the senators, all the Catholic lay people who hold offices that control everything of the open life of the Americans. And then another thing. Go to Tom's reading, Tom Fress's reading from Inquisition Update of the Global Vatican. In 99 parts, Tom examined that book, read, uh, wrote, sorry, <laughs> written written by a knight of Malta, Francis Rooney. He reads it, he explains it, he uh, dissects the book. And it confirms everything 
that already was known in the 1860s and we are living almost 160 years later. Well, 150 to be exact. 2016 now. Oh. Nothing has changed. No, everything was already there. It was there from the start. That's the problem. It was already there from the start, but nobody told you. Nobody told you. Not a single one of the government men would discuss it with me, except after I have given them my word of honor that I would never mention their names. I saw with a profound distress that the influence of Rome was almost supreme in Washington. Well, scratch the almost for today. The influence of Rome is supreme in Washington today. I could not find a single statesman who would dare to face that nefarious influence and fight it down. No, when you do, you get JFK'd. And they all know it. Everyone who is there on a post in Washington knows what happened to JFK, who did it to JFK, why it was done to JFK, because they all know when they talk out of their mouth, they will be the next. One official even told him, quote, This was not through cowardice, as you might think, but through a wisdom you ought to approve if you cannot admire it, unquote. Had there not been censorship and the witnesses had been pressed a little further, quote, many priests would have been comp compromised, for many Surats, one of the four execute, uh, executed uh, conspirators' house, was their common rendezvous, it is more than probable that several of them might have been hanged, unquote. Thirty years after the assassination, thirty years, a member of the Hunter Commission, Brigadier General Thomas M. Harris published a small book revealing that Lincoln's assassination had actually been a Jesuit murder plot to extirpate a Protestant ruler. Harris stated, quote, It is fact well established that the headquarters of the conspiracy was the house of a Roman Catholic family of which Mrs. Mary E. Surratt was the head and that all of its inmates, including a number of boarders, were devoted members of the Roman Catholic Church. This house was the meeting place, the council chamber of Booths and his co-conspirators, including Mrs. Mary A. Sur uh, e. Surratt and her son, John H. Surratt, who, next to Booth, were the most active members of the conspiracy." Unquote. Commissioner Harris went on to relate that Mary Surratt's son, John, had been a Confederate spy for three years, quote, passing back and forth between Washington and Richmond, and from Richmond to Canada and back as a bearer of dispatches, unquote. John's mentor during this period was a Jesuit, Father B. F. Wiggett, president of Gonzaga College and a priest noted for his sympathies for the Confederacy. John introduced Father Wiggett to his mother, and the priest became Mary Surratt's confessor and spiritual director. As well, Father Wiggett gave spiritual direction to the famous John Wilkes Booth, who, through a drunkard, a libertine, and utterly indifferent to matters of religion, was spiritually attracted to him. Quote, the wily Jesuit, sympathizing with Booth in his, op in his political views and in the hope of destroying our government and establishing the Confederacy, was able to convert him to Catholicism. Unquote. Yeah, when you don't believe in any god, you are very easily caught by Roman Catholicism. That's true. Hard evidence of that conversation, of that conversion, sorry, was found on the assassin's corpse. Quote, on examination of Booth's person after his death, it was found that he was wearing a Catholic medal under his vest and over his heart. Unquote. At the conspiracy trial, Father Widget testified to Mary Elizabeth Surratt's quote, good Christian character. Unquote. 
even assuming her complicity in the assassination, Widget as a Jesuit could truthfully say Surat was a good, was a good Christian simply by reserving mentally a that by Christian he meant Roman Catholic. <laughs> How many times do I have to repeat that? Christian is not Roman Catholic. So, Widget as a Jesuit could truthfully say Surat was a good Christian simply by reserving mentally that by Christian he meant Roman Catholic. B. That under the terms of Directorium Inquisitorum, for that you have to look up chapter 8, but I'm going to give you a little summary of Directorium Inquisitorium so that you understand what we are talking here about. He is a heretic who does not believe what the Roman hierarchy teaches. A heretic merits the pains of fire by the gospel of canons, civil law and customs. Heretics must be burned. For the suspicion alone of heresy, purgation is demanded. Magistrates who refuse to take the oath for defense of the faith shall be suspected of heresy. Wars may be commenced by the authority of the church. Indulgences for the remission of all sin belong to those who signed with the cross for the persecution of heretics. Every individual may kill a heretic. Persons who betray heretics shall be rewarded. Heretics may be forced to profess the Roman faith. A heretic, as he sins in all places, may everywhere be judged. Heretics must be sought after and be corrected or exterminated. Heretics enjoy no privileges in law or equity. The goods of heretics are to be considered as confiscated from the perpetration of the crime. The Pope can enact new articles of faith. Definitions of popes and councils are to be received as infallible. Inquisitors may torture witnesses to obtain the truth. It is laudable to torture those of every class who are guilty of heresy. The Pope has power over infidels. The Church may make war with infidels. Those who are strongly suspected are to be reputed as heretics. He who does not inform against heretics shall be deemed as suspected. Inquisitors may allow heretics to witness against heretics, but not for them. Inquisitors must, must not publish the names of informers, witnesses and accusers. Penitent heretics may be condemned to perpetual imprisonment. Inquisitors may provide for their own expenditures and the salaries of their officers from the property of heretics. Inquisitors enjoy the benefits of a plenary indulgence, a full papal forgiveness of sin at all time uh, at all times at life. So I'm going to have a little technical problem right here. So I got to repeat the last sentence. Penitent heretics may be condemned to perpetual imprisonment. Inquisitors may provide for their own expenditures and the salaries of their officers from the property of heretics. Inquisitors enjoy the benefits of a plenary indulgence, a full papal forgiveness of sin at all times in life and in death. So this is just that you understand what Directorium Inquisitorum means. And you can also get back to chapter 8 and read that. And the next quote comes up here. Every individual may kill a heretic, as I just read a little bit from the Directorium Inquisitorium. And point C, that President Lincoln was twice a heretic, for his Protestantism and for his having successfully defended an excommunicated priest. Now take a look at the Lincoln Memorial and you see how they mock that Protestant president United States of America once had. The author continues in the next paragraph, but Mary, after all, quote, kept the nest that hatched the egg, unquote, as President Johnson put it, and was hanged. Conditional to her death sentence was a provision that a petition for mercy would be attached and sent to Johnson. 
By execution day, July 7, 1865, Surratt's daughter Anna had heard nothing from the President. Distraught, she appeared at the White House to beg him for clemency. Two government men stood in her way. Preston King and Senator James Henry Lane denied her access to the President, who later declared he had never received any petition for mercy. The following November, Preston King drowned his body laden with weights. In March, Senator Lane shot himself. Well, those two people took care that Surratt was executed. And Mary E. Surratt was a Jesuit coagitator. Now Preston King drowned the following November and Senator Lane shot himself. Well, I say he was suicided by Jesuits. In the judgment of one modern investigator, quote, some person or persons were apparently determined that Mary Surratt should not live. Unquote. Shortly thereafter, the Supreme Court rendered a landmark decision that would have won all the conspirators a jury trial. Ex parte milligan held at military courts held that military courts have no jurisdiction over civilians. Milligan lent Mary Surratt's death at the, hand of pro at the hands of Protestants an aura of tragedy and Catholic martyrdom. Yeah, the Catholics have another martyr, Mary E. Surratt, who, without her help, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln would not have been possible. But, hey, you just understood when I read to you from the Directorium Inquisitorum that President Lincoln was a heretic. Every individual may kill a heretic. It's emeritus work to kill a heretic. All men are created equal, they say, on the one hand, and on the other hand, they say, well, well if you don't believe us, we can kill you on the spot. It doesn't matter. It's not even a sin to kill a heretic. No, we will even get a special place in heaven. Ah, sounds a little bit like Islam eh, and the 72 virgins or something. On the bottom of page 254, I continue reading. Charles Chinicky obtained important testimony supporting the widely held suspicion of Jesuit responsibility for the assassination. He received from Rev. Francis A. Conwell, chaplain of the 1st Minnesota Regiment, a sworn affidavit saying that on April 14, 1865, he was visiting St. Joseph in Minnesota, location of a Roman Catholic semin seminary. Rev. Conwell swore, he swore, that at about 6 o'clock that evening, the man in charge of the seminary, a storekeeper by the name of J. Angel Linneman, told him and another visitor, Mr. H. P. Bennett, that President Lincoln had, quote-unquote, just been killed. The next day, Reverend Conwell journeyed ten miles to the town of St. Cloud. As soon as he arrived, he asked the hotelier, Mr. Hayworth, if he had heard any news of a presidential assassination. Mr. Haworth had heard nothing, as St. Cloud had neither railroad nor telegraph at the time. On the following morning, April 16th, on his way to preach a sermon in church, Rev. Conwell was handed a copy of a telegram brought up by stagecoach from Anoka, Minnesota. The telegram announced that President Lincoln had been assassinated on Friday evening at about 9 o'clock. On the morning of Monday the 17th, Reverend Conwell hurried up to St. Paul and reported to the newspaper that in St. Joseph he had been informed of President Lincoln's assassination three hours before the event took place. The paper published his report. Quote, We have now before us, wrote Commissioner Harris, positive evidence that these Jesuit fathers, priests of Rome, engaged 
in preparing young men for the priesthood away out of the village of St. Joseph in far off Minnesota, were in correspondence with their brethren in Washington City, and had been informed that the plan to assassinate the president had been matured. The agent for its accomplishment had been found, the time for its execution had been set, and so sure were they of its accomplishment that they, would, uh, that they could announce it as already done three or four hours before it had been consummated. The anticipation of its accomplishment so elated them that they could not refrain from passing it around as a piece of glorious news. Unquote. Meanwhile, through the Lincoln assassination and its aftermath, the Vatican's artist Constantino Bromidi, along with some 70 French and Italian assistants, applied pigmented mortar to the interior canopy of the Capitol Dome. They were still working when the first session of the 39th Congress met on September 4, 1865. Not until the following January did the scaffolding come down. When it did, the viewers were awestruck by what they beheld. Brumidi had crowned the ceiling of America's legislative center with a glorious panoramic visualization from Book 6 of Virgil's Aeneid, where Aena's blind, blind father, Anxiasis, explains Novus Ordo Seclorum. Quote, Here is Caesar and all the line of Julius, all who shall one day pass under the dome of the great sky. This is the man, this is one, of whom so often you have heard the promise, Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium, the land where Saturn reigned in early times. He will extend his power beyond the Garamans, Africans and Indians, over far territories north and south of the zodiacal stars, the Solar Way. Unquote. Now, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latinum? That is Rome. And don't forget, Washington used to bear the name Rome. And this you can read in that statement that was done, taken from Virgil's Aeneid, where Aeneas' blind father explains the Novus Ordo Seclorum, as painted on your dollar bill. <sighs> Washington used to bear the name Rome. Who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium? Caesar Augustus, the deification. So, the epicenter of the apotheosis of Washington is a solar orb. This is the deification of George Washington. George Washington is on the same step as Caesar Augustus. Do you get it? For them, he is. For them he is. The epicenter of apotheosis of Washington is a solar orb, the sun god, into which Augustus Caesar was said to have been absorbed when his body died. From the capital's highest interior point, Augustus radiates his golden light outward and downward to the next in the line of Julius, the deified George Washington. The god Washington occupies the judgment seat of heaven, sword of justice firmly clasped in his left hand, basking in the light of Augustus, Pontifex Maximus. He rules, quote, over far, <coughs> over far territories north and south of the zodiacal stars, the solar way. Like his Caesarian forebears, Washington is God, Caesar, fa father of his country. On the right hand of the father sits Minerva, holding the emblem of Roman totalitarianism, the fasci. Minerva, we recall, 
was the virgin goddess of the Sacred Heart. I'm not going back into Sacred Heart. Read it for yourselves. Or listen to it again. It was she who rescued the heart of the Son of God and placed it with Jupiter in heaven. She was called Minerva when praised for her justice and wisdom. When praised for her beauty and love, Minerva was known as Venus, Queen of Heaven. She and Venus were often identified with each other, just as statues of both were reconsecrated. Re reconsecrated. Mary through Roman Catholic missionary adaption, as we already read before in this book, in a chapter called Missionary Adaption. She and Venus, she, Minerva, and Venus were often identified with each other, just as stages of both were reconsecrated Mary through Roman Catholic missionary adaption. Minerva's most persistent role in ancient paganism was Dea Benigna, the Mediatrix. She heard the prayers of sinful mortals and passed them on to Jupiter in the same way Roman Mary is believed to pass Catholic prayers to Christ. Completing the circular composition around the solarized Augustus are 13 nubile goddesses. These are the original states. They dance weightlessly in space, supporting a white banner inscribed with the soul of the Bacchic Gospel, E Pluribus Unum. Above the head of each state goddess floats a magical white pentagram. Beneath all this celestial revelry, revelry Brumidi painted more Roman gods mingling with American mortals. Here is Vulcan the god of fire and craftsmanship, planting his foot on a cannon, while his workers prepare munitions and weapons of death and destruction. And over here Neptune rises with his trident from the sea in a horse-drawn scallop shell chariot. And where the wise mediatrix communicates with American scientist Benjamin Franklin, Samuel F. B. Morse, inventor of the code, and Robert Fulton, inventor of the steamship. And here, the goddess immaculately conceived the dreadnought Mary, wearing the pentagrams and eagle headdress of Thomas Crawford's statue atop the dome's exterior. She mobilizes her sword and shield against a pack of fleeing sinners labeled tyranny and kingly power. Also, a picture, by the way, of the cover of Rulers of Evil. Jupiter's mascot. The Roman eagle glides just behind her, clutching a bunch of thunderbolts in his talons. Innocent in her flowing scarlet cape, the goddess is situated exactly beneath the deified George Washington, coming between him and the embattled viewing public gazing up from ground level. It is the graphic realization of Pio Nono's Ubi Primum, which decreed the Virgin Mary was, quote, set up between Christ and his church, always delivering the Christian people from their greatest calamities and from the snars and assaults of all their enemies." Unquote. The eagle gliding behind Mary explains the otherwise inscrutable seal of the United States Justice Department, which contains a wing-spread eagle surrounded by the motto Qui pro domina justitia sequitur, which stands for he who follows the goddess just justice. Persephone, or Minerva, the mediatrix, when judging the sinfully dead in Hades, was called justitia, or justice. The he of the justice department's motto identifies the eagle, symbol of Rome. Rome follows the goddess justice, that is, the immaculately conceived mother of God in her judicial capacity. Rainbow sweeps across the lower quadrant of the dome of the sky from Benjamin Franklin to a young boy wearing a smurf cap and a toga. The boy attends a goddess who reclines on a large horse-drawn reaper. She's Persephone's mother Ceres, 
who was reconsecrated by early missionary adaption as Anna, mother of the Virgin Mary. The golden boy is officially designated Young America. Although Brumidi has hidden the boy's face from us, he deserves our careful scrutiny for one very important reason. Bearing the name America, he is the only element in the sacred national iconography that defines the character of the American person as perceived by government. Young American Smurf cap is a style of headgear known as the Phrygian cape. Phrygia was a district of the kingdom of Pergamon. We remember Pergamon. It was the middle point in the transfer of Babylonian religion westward to Rome. Phrygia is a Greek word meaning free men. Our English word free comes from the first syllable phry, P-H-R-Y. Phrygian keeps, caps, sorry, <laughs> Phrygian keeps, <laughs> Phrygian, <laughs> Phrygian keeps, yeah, no, Phrygian caps were given to freed Roman slaves to indicate their new liberated status. Roman law regards liberty as a conditional status. The freedom given to you by man can also be taken by man. Only the freedom given by God lasts eternal, I always say. Phrygian caps were given to freed Roman slaves to indicate their new liberated status, but Roman law regards liberty as a conditional status. Once granted by a patron, it could be revoked at any time for any cause. Phrygian cap freedom, then, means liberty. Freed Roman slaves, by the way, were called liberty. To please Caesar. Once again, Phrygian cap freedom, then, means liberty. To please Caesar. We remember from chapter 8 how Ignatius described such freedom in section 353.1. Of his spiritual exercises. Quote, we must put aside all judgment of our own and keep the mind ever ready and prompt to obey in all things the hierarchical church. Of course those liberty bold enough to protest that their superiors commanded lost their freedom no matter how lucid and reasonable their own judgment might have been. They were reverted to slavery. Since the advent of the Febronian State Church, the reversion of Protestant liberty, or Protestants, to slavery has been so methodically insidious that it's hardly noticeable. The shackles are psychological, human, uh, humanely fitted by increasing varieties of spiritual exercise. Like Aenas, Anchises, Julius Ascanius and their Trojan followers, most Americans are indeed Phrygian cap freemen, free to sacrifice their individuality to the greater glory of Rome. That means to sacrifice individuality for the collective purpose. As Virgil stated earlier in his work, as you remember from an earlier chapter of this book. I think it was chapter 21 or 22. You get the jest? If not, go back and read the chapter again. Most Americans are indeed Phrygian cap free men, free to sacrifice their individuality for the greater glory of Rome. What is that else than patriotism where they got you with? You sacrifice your own life for the better of the state, right? But the state is Rome and not what you think it is. So, get out of the deception. Study this. Read the whole book again. The farther I go in this book, the more important seem to me the earlier chapters were. I think I have to read it also all over again. 
Like Aenas, Anchises, Julius Ascanius and their Trojan followers, most Americans, let's say everyone who is not in the kind of power position, are indeed Phrygian freemen, kept freemen, free only to sacrifice their individuality to the greater glory of Rome. The black obelisk of Kala, which stands in the Babylonian Assyrian wing of the British Museum, records the great accomplishments of the 9th century BC god king Shalmaneser II. In a scene depicting various monarchs paying obeisance to Babylon, we see one monarch kneeling before Shalmaneser, worshipping him. And this is the picture that I put in the video here. Shalmaneser in turn offers a sacrifice to an eight-pointed star set within a bird's wing and tail feathers. Inscriptions identify this kneeling monarch as King Jehu of Israel. Remarkably, according to the New Catholic Encyclopedia, Jehu's likeness here is the only known contemporan contemporaneously rendered portrait of a biblical personage. More remarkably, Jehu is wearing the Phrygian cap. Like Promedes young America, Jehu's liberty is subject to the mood of his god king. So here you read something that appears in the Bible and you have a sketch from that, that is not from the Bible, that is from paganism, dealing with Jehu, a king of the Jews at that time, wearing the cap of freedom of the Phrygians, of the Roman freed slaves, a king wearing a slave's cap, bowing down to King Shalmaneser, worshipping him. Hmm. So the Jews were not only worshipping God. No! They always fell off that belief and worshipped sun worship and other men like in this etch, sketch, whatever you want to call it, this picture that I put up here of the freedom cap. See for yourself, falling from the belief of God, the God of the Bible, and you will be punished. Oh, and the Jews got punished in Babylon and beyond for that. The Bible confirms the testimony of the black obelisk. At 2 Kings 10, verse 31, we read, quote, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. Unquote. Scripture further tells us that Jehu worshipped the golden calf a sacred Babylonian icon made fashionable in 10th century BC Israel by Jehu's predecessor, Jeroboam. Jeroboam renounced, quote, the law of the Lord God of Israel, unquote, and instituted democracy. Democracy opened the Israelite priesthood, originally appointed by Yahweh exclusively to the family of Levi, to all applicants. Oh, ho, 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 ho. what is this? Isn't that something that you can compare with religious freedom in 1776 in the United States of America? Democracy opened the Israelites priesthood originally appointed by Yahweh exclusively to the family of Levi to all applicants. Before 1776, the political world ruling in the United States of America, which were then 13 colonies, was only open to Protestants and not to Catholics. So, with religious freedom and the founding of the nation-state of 1776, the United States of America, religious freedom opened the door for Catholics, and here in the Bible history we read that the democracy opened the Israelite priesthood originally appointed by Yahweh exclusively to the family of Levi to all applicants. It's another way to sail around the law of God, something Rome is very, very good in. Consequently, Yahweh's priesthood was infiltrated by non-believers, 
and foreign sympathizers. They prepared the way for Jehu to make of himself a Phrygian freeman, obligated to conquer with obedience of the understanding in all things which, is his, uh, which his superior, Shalmaneser II, commanded, exactly as the black obelisk explains in lucid visual terms. As a direct result of Jehu's departure from, God of, from the God of Israel, the Israelite nation began falling apart. It was ultimately destroyed by Caesarean Rome, the legitimate heir to Shalmaneser's Babylonian authority, as it passed down through Pergamum. When was it ultimately destroyed? The Israel of God of the Bible? ultimately destroyed by Caesarean Rome in 70 AD, exactly as Jesus predicted in Matthew 24. And there will be no stone left upon another for the destroying of the temple and the destroying of the city. Seventy weeks are determined on thy people and on thy holy city, Jerusalem, to make an end of discretion. Seventy weeks, 490 years, and then it's over. It's over. You are no longer the exclusive recipients of God's law, but it will be brought to the Gentiles afterwards. It was ultimately destroyed by Caesarian Rome, the legitimate heir to Shalmaneser's Babylonian authority, because Rome is the heir of Babylon. Rome is the modern Babylon. Rome and Babylon are the same. Go to Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons and you understand why. Well, the author continues, running throughout this cosmic battle of the face is a highly refined cabala involving the concept of golden calf. The word calf in Hebrew, the language of Yehu and Jeroboam, is... Dip, 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 I can't read that word here in Hebrew, written, pronounced eagle. Aha! Running throughout this cosmic battle of the face is a highly refined cabala involving the concept of golden calf. The word calf in Hebrew, the language of Jehu and Jerobim, is pronounced eagle. Whereas Jehu gave his people Shamanizah's golden eagle to worship, the church militant has trained the American public to worship Rome's golden eagle which surmounts every flagpole. Could it be that if we show respect, affection or loyalty toward the national eagle we create the presumption of worshipping the golden calf and so alienate ourselves from the God of the Bible and in the vacuum find ourselves under the rule of the church militant? Well, think about it. Could it really be that we are all duped into doing things in a way that means something totally different to the all-knowing God and He will pour out His wrath on our ignorance because we just didn't bother to study those facts available? Well, a lot of people say that God will not punish the ignorant and I'm quite sure that He won't, but on the other hand, this is all already more than ignorance, not to read the signs, not here and there to read a book and question everything. The reason why I am here today and sitting this and reading this book is because I question everything. I didn't used to. Oh, I was gullible. I have to admit that. But I'm not so much anymore. And I'm glad I'm not. And now reading this book really opens my eyes. And while we think it is nothing to, you know, show respect, affection or loyalty toward the national eagle, that that actually stands for a golden calf. And we all know what happened to the golden calf when Moses came down 
Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments in his hand and what happened to the golden calf they built at that time. And we find ourselves under the rule of the church militant, Regimini Militante Ecclesiae, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. We alienate ourselves from God of the Bible and in the vacuum that we've alienated ourselves from the God from the Bible of, we find ourselves under the rule of the Jesuits. On the bottom of page 260 the author continues, according to J.C. Johnson, in his biography of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, as General Washington was planning his famous expedition against Cornwallis at Yorktown, quote, the army was destitute, the government treasury was empty, her credit shivering in the wind. Unquote. Suddenly, a miracle in the annals of philanthropy occurred. Robert Morris, superintendent of finance, the highest officer in the United States under the Articles of, Con uh, under the Articles of Confederation from 1781, personally raised 80 cannon and a hundred pieces of field artillery. In addition, he raised, quote, all other necessary supplies not furnished from other sources, unquote, and became personally, quote, responsible to the amount of $1,400,000 upon his own notes, which were promptly paid at maturity. This enabled the American army to give the finishing stroke to the revolution and triumph in victory complete over a proud and merciless foe. Unquote. So goes a historian's version of how Robert Morris saved America. The official version is revealed in Constantino Blumidi's Apotheosis of Washington. Here we see Superintendent Morris gazing up from his account ledger at yet another Roman deity. We recognize the deity from the familiar Caduceus in his right hand from the winged scandal he thrust to within kissing distance of Morris' lips, from the shadowy bag of gold and tantalizingly dangles in Morris's face. The deity is Mercury, the psychopomp, the trickster, the patron deity of commerce, deceivers and thieves. Mercury, the brilliant, lovable, Pied Piper deity who deceived the souls of sinful humanity into following him exuberantly down into the oblivion of Hades. Just as Sebastiano Ricci's painting subtly established the Mercury as the guiding spirit of modern Roman Catholicism, Bromides' painting acknowledges the same deity's ascendancy over the fulfillment of the American Revolution. Amazing stuff, these pictures. Well, I'd say, amazing stuff, these pictures. So now I have to check something here. Yeah, amazing stuff, these pictures, right? And now I'm going to give you a real good explanation of this. I'm going to open here another website from hucha.com, the apotheosis of Washington. And I will give you an explanation that is not in the book of Rulers of Evil, but that will go very deep into explanation and showing the pictures. So have a look and listen at my explanation I give to you. The Apotheosis of Washington is an image that would seem very strange to most of us, but not one that would have been reviewed uh, uh, that way by many of our so-called founding fathers, among whom George Washington was a mason. He, unlike other slave-owning founding fathers, did free his slaves upon his death. He did what was moral, ethical and right. Well, yeah, I don't agree with that writing here, but... Here comes the first picture, the apotheosis of Washington, as seen looking up from the capital rotunda. The Apotheosis of Washington is the very large fresco painted by Italian artist Constantino Bromidi in 1865 and visible through the oculus of the dome in the rotunda of the United States Capitol building. 
The fresco is suspended 180 feet above the rotunda floor and covers an area of 4664 square feet. The figures painted are up to 15 feet tall and are visible from the floor below. The dome was completed in 1863 and Brumidi painted it over the course of 11 months at the end of the Civil War. He was paid $40,000, which is all, almost $600,000 in 2008 worth of dollars for the fresco and fiat money. Yeah. Brumidi had worked for three years in the Vatican under Pope Gregory the XVI uh, and served several aristocrats as an artist for palaces and villas, including the Prince Tolonia. He immigrated to the United States in 1852 and spent much of his last 25 years of his life working in the capital. In addition to the apotheosis of Washington, he designed also the Brumidi corridors. The apotheosis of Washington depicts George Washington ascending to the heavens. Apotheosis stands for the elevation or exaltation of a person to the rank of a god. Deification, right? Washington, the first US president and commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, during the American Revolutionary War, is allegorically represented, surrounded by figures from classical mythology. Washington is draped in purple, a royal color, with a rainbow arch at his feet, flanked by the goddess Victory, draped in green, using a horn, to his left, and the goddess Liberty to his right. Liberty wears a red cap, symbolizing emancipation from a Roman tradition where sons leaving the home would be given a red cap. She holds a fasci in her right hand and an open book in the other. Forming a circle between Liberty and Victoria are thirteen maidens, each with a star above their head, a pentagram representing the original thirteen colonies. Several of the maidens, or goddesses I call them, have their backs turned to Washington, set to represent the colonies that had seceded from the Union at the time of the printing of the painting. Surrounding Washington, the two goddesses and the thirteen maidens are six scenes linning the perimeter, each representing a national concept allegorically. From directly below Washington, in the center and moving clockwise, we see war, science, marine, commerce, mechanics and agriculture. Now I'm going to explain to you the picture of war, as you can see here in the video. Freedom, also known as Columbia, is directly below Washington in the personification of war. The scene depicts a woman fighting for liberty with a raised sword, a cape and a helmet and a shield in the colors of the American flag, trampling figures representing tyranny and kingly power. To freedom's left assisting her is a fierce bald eagle the bald eagle is the national bird of the United States and, as we have learned, also in Hebrew, the golden calf, carrying arrows and a thunderbolt, reminiscent of the arrows carried by the eagle in the great seal of the United States. The next picture that we see is called Science. Minerva, the Roman goddess of crafts and wisdom, is portrayed with helmet and a spear pointing to an electrical generator, creating power stored in batteries next to a printing press, representing great American inventions. American scientists and inventors Benjamin Franklin, Samuel F. B. Morse and Robert Fulton watch. In the left part of the scene, a teacher demonstrates the use of dividers. The next picture we see is called Marine, and this scene shows Neptune, the Roman sea god, with trident and crown of seaweed riding in a shell chariot drawn by seahorses. Venus, the goddess of love born from the sea, is depicted helping to lay the transatlantic telegraph cable which ran from America to the telegraph field in Ireland. In the background is an iron cloud warship with smokestacks. Next picture coming up is called Commerce. Mercury, god of commerce, with his winged petastos and sandals and uh, 
uh, and the Caduceus Cadu is depicted giving a bag of gold to American Revolutionary War financier Robert Morris. To the left, Min move a box on a dolly. On the right, the anchor and sailors lead into Marine. The next picture is called Agriculture. Ceres, the goddess of agriculture, is shown with a wreath of wheat and cornucopia, symbol of plenty, while sitting on a McCormick mechanical reaper. The personification of young America in a liberty cap holds the reins of the horses while the goddess Flora gathers flowers in the foreground. So now you got an explanation of these pictures and I'm gonna add another one that was missing here but I don't remember the name right now. You will see it in the video but there's no description of that uh, given. So I cannot explain that one. But this was already an extra explanation that was not given in the book Rulers of Evil that I found on another site. But you see now, this is really amazing stuff, these pictures. And what these pictures tell, they all tell you a story. You know, they all tell you a story. And like so many of the testimonies presented in this book, the supremacy of the church militant, the publication of Sun Chuan strategies in a Western language, the names, the numbers, the dates, the locus and layout of the federal city, the architecture, the statuary, the monuments, the emblems, the frescoes, the ceremonies, they come not from the trickster's victims, but from the trickster himself. Mercury? Satan. It's as if he point, as, as if the point of the trick is to warn the victim beforehand in words and pictures that he or she is about to be tricked. A con is much, much sweeter when the mark actually consents to the con. That way the trickster's conscience is clear. Constantino Brumidi continued decorating the dome of the great sky well into his seventies. In 1879 at the age of 74 while painting Penn's treaty with the Indians, on the rotunda frieze, he slipped from the scaffold. Dangling 58 feet from the marble floor, he held on until help came. He escaped a deadly fall, but the shock of the experience killed him a few months later. And this continues chapter 23, the dome of the great sky. Hey! Quiet! Come here! Take a look! It looks like St. Peter's! Washington in the lap of Rome! The mirror image of the beast! It's like St. Peter's! Where are we? It's like St. Peter's! 